vamos dar início ao nosso nono painel da FESB virtual de 2020. A nossa sessão, então, ela será um misto de português e inglês e vamos iniciar é, com a, a palestra da professora Sandra Rodrigues de Mascarenhas, da Universidade Federal da Paraíba, seguida da professora Isis Rara Trebenzori, da Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, e por último, o professor Jorge é, Cruzos, da Universidade de Atenas, na Grécia. I would like to thank the FESB Organization Committee, especially Ana Davel and uh, Hernandes, for uh, allow this conference, and also our speakers. Uh, With help of all, the first phase online is being a, a success, and I would invite you to watch the other ses sessions as well. So, uh, to start our session, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Sandra Mascarenhas from the Federal University of Paraíba. She is a biomedical science who has chief of his chief of the cellular and molecular biology department and was coordinator of the biotechnology post-graduation from the same university. She also worked at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Universidade Autónoma de Madrid, and Universidade Complutense de Madrid in Spain. Professor Mascarena has mentored scientists in the immune endocrine area for more than 10 years. She has more than 30 works in this area. Please welcome Professor Sandra Mascarenha. Thank you. Muito obrigada pela presença de vocês. A Flávia me pediu para fazer os slides em inglês, mas para falar em português. Bem, inicialmente eu gostaria de agradecer o convite da Flávia. Flávia, que foi minha ex-estudante de iniciação científica, ninguém precisa saber quando, né, Flávia, para ninguém entregar a idade de ninguém. E queria agradecer também a organização geral é, da FESB pela oportunidade de, de poder contar um pouco do trabalho que o nosso grupo desenvolve na Universidade Federal da Paraíba. E eu vou falar para vocês sobre é, o efeito anti-inflamatório da uabaína. A uabaína, que é, foi originalmente é, isolada de plantas, é um esteroide cardiotônico utilizado há mais de 200 anos para o tratamento de insuficiência cardíaca. A abaína também pode ser extraída da apocântero abaio e também foi utilizada como um veneno em flechas em diversas, tri em diversas tribos africanas. Ah, posteriormente, a abaína foi extraída de, de plantas do gênero estrofantos e, e utilizada como estimulante cardíaco também em outras tribos. Em 1775, é, Extratos de digitálicos foram utilizados para o tratamento de problemas de insuficiência cardíaca. E em 1855, Ringer já propôs a existência de um constituinte endógeno capaz de gerar a contração do ventrículo do coração. Quase 100 anos depois, foi postulada então a existência de um digitálico endógeno em mamíferos. No entanto, foi somente em 1991 que o grupo de Hamlin e colaboradores identificou na circulação de mamíferos a uabaína endógena. A uabaína endógena pode, então, ser é, secretada e produzida em diversas condições fisiológicas do nosso organismo, após o estresse, hipertensão, gravidez, após o exercício físico. Classicamente, a uabaína é conhecida por inibir a sódio potássio TPase, aumentando os níveis de sódio intracelular, que por sua vez vão reverter o trocador de sódio cálcio. Sendo assim, a gente vai ter um aumento dos níveis, um aumento dos níveis de cálcio citosólico que dispara a contração cardíaca, motivo pelo qual ela é utilizada uh, na terapia. A lobaína endógena, ela é sintetizada pelo córtex adrenal, pelo hipotálamo, e em condições que coincidem com a síntese de cortisol. No entanto, os efeitos da uabaína no sistema imunológico, né, o seu impacto em processos inflamatórios, ainda não são completamente esclarecidos e são alvo de estudos no nosso grupo. A uabaína, se ligando à sua subunidade alfa, da sódio de potássio ATPase, é capaz de ativar diferentes vias de sinalização, mapquinase, as vias da SRC, a peitrasquinase, AKT e muitas outras. A ativação dessas distintas vias de sinalização 
vão ser capazes de é, regular a expressão gênica das células de forma diferenciada de acordo com suas características, de acordo com a concentração de abutuabaína, é, assuntos que a gente vai discutir mais à frente nessa apresentação. Recentemente, mais especificamente em março de 2020, Hamlin, que foi o, aquele pesquisador que identificou a abaína é, na circulação, publicou junto com Blaustein uma revisão muito completa, falando sobre os efeitos da abaína endógena. E dentro desse contexto, foi discutido o efeito da abaína em processos inflamatórios, na modulação de citocinas, ativação do sistema imunológico, e é dentro desse aspecto que eu vou focar a minha apresentação. Mas eu gostaria de lembrar também que a albaína é capaz de interferir em processos neuroinflamatórios, com efeitos neuroprotetores, regulando níveis de citocinas como interleucino beta, TNF, regula também os níveis de BDNF. E esses trabalhos são conduzidos pelo grupo do nosso amigo e colaborador, Cristóforo Scavone, na USP. Mas o foco dessa apresentação é o efeito da babaína no sistema imunológico. Né? E ela pode ser considerada uma molécula, uma molécula imunomodulatória pelos seus inúmeros efeitos no sistema imune. A professora Vimea Bunjanek, da UFRJ, foi a pioneira no estudo da babaína nas células do sistema imunológico. Foi ela que introduziu o assunto e foi com ela que eu fiz toda a minha formação científica, desde a graduação até o doutorado. O grupo da professora Vivian publicou um trabalho, um dos primeiros trabalhos, onde a albaína é capaz de inibir a ativação de linfócitos NK em células LAC, né? nas células uh, natural killer ativadas. É, também foi demonstrado que a albaína é capaz de inibir a proliferação de linfócitos sob distintos estímulos de mitógenos, de éster, de forbol. E depois desse trabalho, muitos outros trabalhos do grupo né? e de outros também, demonstraram que a albaína é capaz de interferir desde a maturação de linfócitos T e B, Uh, na ativação de células como a NK, que eu acabei de falar, a secreção de citocinas por monócitos, uh, interfere nas funções de granulócitos. Então, de maneira geral, a albaína é capaz de regular células maduras e maturas do sistema imunológico, modulando a sua função, modificando é, níveis de citocinas e, em especial, os processos inflamatórios. Bem... É, nesse trabalho do nosso grupo, quando eu ainda era estudante de doutorado com a, com a Vivian, nós fomos investigar a expressão das isoformas alfa, que estão presentes na soja de potássio ATPase, em células do sistema imunológico. A isoforma alfa é o sítio de ligação da uabaína, né, e responsável também pelas propriedades catalíticas e de transporte da soja de potássio ATPase. E nós podemos observar que tanto a isoforma alfa 1, alfa 2 e alfa 3 estão presentes nas células do timo, do baço e do linfonodo. Uh, tão importante quanto o conhecimento científico é, desse trabalho foi a participação e a colaboração do professor emérito da UFRJ, é, o professor Franklin Runjanek. O professor Franklin Runjanek faleceu esse domingo e eu gostaria de prestar essa homenagem para um pesquisador incrível da UFRJ, para uma pessoa que fazia divulgação científica, ele foi meu primeiro professor quando eu entrei na graduação, é uma perda enorme para a ciência do nosso país, um homem maravilhoso que tinha inclusive um senso de humor inesquecível, inigualável. Então perde o Brasil mais um pesquisador que foi o professor Franklin Rujanek. Continuando, é, esse trabalho, nesse trabalho, nós utilizamos em vivo é, ou a, baína, a associação de ou a baína e hidrocortisona. Se vocês lembrarem que eu falei lá no início, a ou a baína, ela pode ser sintetizada nas mesmas situações onde há síntese de, de glicocorticoides, como, por exemplo, em situações de estresse. E nesse trabalho, nós nos perguntamos se seria, qual seria o resultado dessa associação na apoptose de timócitos, né, que são os precursores dos linfócitos T. E nós observamos, de maneira muito resumida, que os corticóides são capazes de aumentar a expressão de fosfato de ocerina, né, aumentando a morte celular, induzindo a apoptose, mas a associação com a albaína causa um sinergismo da apoptose desencadeada por essa molécula, por essa substância. O mecanismo de ação envolvido parece é, envolver a inibição da fosforilação da MAP kinase, isso a gente mostrou no outro trabalho, a inibição do gmgnfat c que podem culminar com a redução dos níveis de CD25 na superfície dessas células, que são importantes para o processo de 
maturação, desenvolvimento e de viabilidade. Sendo assim, é, esses dois trabalhos mostram que a associação de glicocorticoides com a guaína, que podem acontecer é, em situações de estresse, tem um efeito é, exacerbado na morte celular e que a via de sinalização envolve NFAT, PDT8. Essas vias de sinalização também estão envolvidas em processos inflamatórios. Bem, a inflamação é um processo complexo, multifatorial, que envolve não só o sistema imunológico, mas também o sistema nervoso, o sistema endócrino, com transdução de sinal, é, vários mediadores, vários tipos de células, citocinas. E dentro desse aspecto, é, nosso grupo é, começou a trabalhar com o efeito da uabaína nesses processos inflamatórios. Então, nessa pequena revisão, nós enfocamos principalmente nos possíveis efeitos antagônicos da uabaína, a depender do tipo de célula que está se utilizando, do microambiente, do estado de ativação dessa célula e da concentração também, ou da dose de uabaína. Baixas concentrações ou doses têm, na maioria das vezes, efeitos anti-inflamatórios, com inibição da fósforo P38, como eu mencionei para vocês, e de outros aspectos do processo inflamatório que a gente já vai conversar. Por outro lado, é, concentrações ou doses maiores de uabaína podem desencadear, podem desencadear efeitos deletérios para o organismo, como processos é, pró-inflamatórios. Ah, isso pode ser demonstrado, o efeito anti-inflamatório da uabaína pode ser demonstrado nesse, nesse nosso paper, onde a gente usa um modelo muito simples, né? o modelo da indução de edema de pata por diferentes agentes logísticos. Quando esses animais são pré-tratados com a uabaína, e vale lembrar que todos os trabalhos do nosso grupo são feitos com baixas concentrações de uabaína, que se aproximam dos valores fisiológicos ou alcançados farmacologicamente. Então, como eu estava falando, animais que são pré-tratados com uabaína têm uma redução desse, eczema de, desse edema de pata, que foi induzido por prostaglandina 2 e por bradicinina. Né, esse edema, que é uma das principais das características mais precoces do processo inflamatório, é, é inibido por essa molécula. E nesse trabalho, além disso, nós também observamos que a abaína interfere na nossa excepção. Adicionalmente, também num trabalho em vivo, nós utilizamos outro modelo, injetando zimosano no peritônio dos animais. Né? O zimosano, que é uma, um componente da parede celular de fungo, representa o um modelo clássico de inflamação amplamente utilizado, você consegue obter dali um lavado né, peritoneal com vários tipos de células, citocinas, é, fatores solúveis, e dentro dos aspectos que foram é, analisados nesse paper, nós observamos que a uabaína é capaz de inibir a migração de neutrófilos, aqui marcados com GR1, citometria de fluxo, desencadeado pelo processo inflamatório do zimosan. Então, mais um aspecto que é inibido pela uabaína, além do edema, é a migração de neutrófilos para o sítio inflamado. Nós também avaliamos é, citocinas, então a uabaína reduz citocinas pró-inflamatórias presentes nesse modelo, como interleucino beta e tnf alfa. aqui a gente tem o efeito do zimosan, aumentando essas citocinas e o tratamento com a uabaína. E, adicionalmente, a uabaína também reduz a ativação da gnf B foi desencadeada pelo modelo, pelo modelo inflamatório, né? sugerindo novas evidências para os mecanismos de ação anti-inflamatórios dessa molécula que foi observada por nós. Nesses modelos, né, nós observamos é, processos de indução do processo inflamatório, mas aqui a gente resolveu fazer essa indução do processo inflamatório utilizando um agente infeccioso, e para isso a gente utilizou a leishmania. Então, nós fomos observar o efeito da uabaína na inflamação desencadeada por esse agente. E nós observamos que, novamente, né, a uabaína ela foi capaz de reduzir o processo inflamatório, alterou a migração de células, níveis de citocinas, reduziu o número de macrófagos infectados por leishmania, mostrando mais uma vez que a uabaína possui um papel anti-inflamatório num outro modelo. Adicionalmente, nós também fomos observar o papel da uabaína o outro modelo, dessa vez um modelo crônico né, de inflamação das vezes superiores aéreas, utilizando a valbumina. Nesse modelo, é uma citocina muito importante, entre várias, né, interleucina 4, né, importante para diferenciação de linfócitos do perfil TRLP4, para sua manutenção, 
assim como outras citocinas. Uh, e nós observamos que os animais, né, o nosso controle positivo, os animais que estão com processo inflamatório têm altos níveis de interleucina 4, e os animais que foram pré-tratados com a abaína têm esses níveis de interleucina 4 inibidos. E da mesma forma como visto nos modelos anteriores, a, a, a abaína é capaz de reduzir a migração de células para o lavado broncoalveolar. A gente teve uma redução de linfócitos, redução de eosinófilos, que são células é, muito importantes nesse processo. E, novamente, nós observamos redução de neutrófilos no sítio inflamado quando os animais eram tratados com a abaína. Ah. Ah, esse trabalho daqui também é do nosso grupo, é, com outro esteroide cardiotônico endógeno, a marinofagenina. E nós observamos o mesmo fenômeno, tá? esse trabalho foi publicado com o Luiz Quintas da UFRJ, também nosso colaborador, e nós também observamos que a associação da marinobufagenina com o zimozan, no mesmo modelo que eu mostrei no trabalho com a obaína, também foi capaz de reduzir o número de neutrófilos para o sítio inflamado. Dessa forma, nós nos perguntamos é, que mecanismos estariam envolvidos na redução da migração dessas células para o sítio inflamado, que foi observado em diferentes modelos. Então, nós fomos avaliar é, quimiocinas, receptores de quimiocinas, vários aspectos, e encontramos que a albaína é capaz de reduzir os níveis de expressão de uma molécula de adesão, uma integrina chamada CD18. A CD18 ela é uma integrina é, expressa, né, precede o processo de transmigração das células para o sítio inflamado. E nós observamos que o tratamento de neutrófilos com a albaína é capaz de reduzir os níveis dessa molécula é, e justificando um pouco dos resultados que nós temos observado a, a, ao longo desses anos. Adicionalmente, trabalhando ainda com neutrófilos, esses dados aí agora não foram publicados ainda, estão em andamento, é, nós temos observado o efeito da, da albaína na liberação das NETs nas redes de neutrófilo, né? E a gente está fazendo outros estudos em paralelo para poder melhor entender esse processo. Sendo assim, né, eu concluo essa apresentação é, mostrando que a albaína apresenta efeito anti-inflamatório tanto em vivo, na, na periferia, possui também efeito analgésico, é capaz de interferir no processo inflamatório desencadeado por prostaglandina e bradicinina, interfere na nossa excepção. A albaína é capaz de inibir a formação do edema, que foi aquele trabalho que eu mostrei para vocês, inicialmente com edema de pata. Ela é capaz de interferir no processo de migração celular, né, na nossa excepção, que eu conversei com vocês anteriormente, em modelos tanto agudos quanto crônicos, alterando níveis de citocinas e migração de células para o, sérgio, para o, para o sítio inflamado, via de sinalização, a albaína também interfere é, em vários aspectos do processo inflamatório desencadeada pela leishmania. E, finalmente, nós demonstramos que essa inibição da migração de neutrófilos para o sítio inflamado parece estar associada com a redução da molécula de adesão dessa integrina CD18. Sendo assim, eu gostaria, então, de agradecer a professora Vivian Runjanek, da UFRJ, Uh, foi quem, como eu falei anteriormente, foi a pessoa que começou a estudar o abaína no sistema imunológico, a, piore, a pioneira nesse trabalho que eu fiz toda a minha formação. Queria agradecer ao professor Cristóforo Scavone da USP, Márcia Piovesan, da UFRJ, Ana Voto, da FURG, Luiz Quintas, da UFRJ, Márcia Rosa, que é minha parceira na UFPB. É, nesse intervalo, vários alunos passaram pelo, pelo meu laboratório e vou utilizar a equipe atual do laboratório para representar todos esses alunos. Ah, o Luiz Henrique é atualmente meu estudante de pós-doutorado, que também me emprestou alguns slides para essa apresentação e fundamental para o nosso grupo, assim como meus estudantes de doutorado José Guilherme, José Marreiro, Écia Lima, Deise Carvalho, Juliane França, Silva, sem o qual nada disso seria possível. Agradecer também ao apoio financeiro da CAPES, através do PROCAD, FINEP, CNPq, uh, Via Universal e Pronex, e também ao apoio da FAPESC. Thanks so much for a great presentation. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Isis Trevisoni for the next lecture.
uh, maternal nutrition and hypothalamic programming of energy metabolism. Dr. Is have a PhD in Utah University and uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And Dr. Is developed great uh, studies about the reprogramming in the hypothalamus to control the metabolism function. Okay, Dr. Isis. Thank you very much, John, for your presentation. And uh, I would like to thank first the organizing committee of FESB for this opportunity to share with you some of our data in this research project in metabolic programming that we are developing here in the molecular uh, field. Um, and today I will talk to you about the importance of maternal nutrition during early life and the development of the hypothalamus and, and the importance of hypothalamus in energy metabolism control. Adequate maternal nutrition is very important in early life for the proper early growth and development of the offspring. And this is uh, especially important during a uh, pregestational period, during gestation, and also lactation that are critical periods of plasticity for the offspring in gestation and lactation. Uh, maternal nutrition importantly impacts placenta function and also milk composition in terms of macro and micronutrients. Interestingly, uh, both under and over nutrition uh, in women are associated with the risk of developing metabolic dysfunction in the offspring throughout life. And uh, in Brazil and also very, uh, very many other countries, uh, we face um, an epidemiological um, phenomenon known as nutritional transition in which we have uh, over time less undernutrition and increasing rates of obesity and overweight in the population. Uh, These increasing rates of obesity and overweight is highly associated with uh, increased consumption of high fat and high sugar diet. And uh, we are particularly interested in this um, metabolic dysfunction during reproductive age, because uh, in Brazil, around 50% of women in, in reproductive age are obese or overweight. And this is a health problem, not only for the mothers, but also for the offspring health. And this is a phenomenon known as metabolic programming. Um, in metabolic programming, uh, insults in early life, such as nutritional insults, environmental insults, and also endocrine insults, um, are involved in the adaptation or maladaptation of the offspring, mainly during this critical window of development, during the, the first thousand days of life, and this causes uh, maladaptation in, in several tissues uh, that predispose this offspring to develop several diseases throughout life, such as obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and also stress. In the literature, we can find several insults, different insults that are involved in metabolic programming of disease. Uh, in nutrition, uh, it's, uh, it's very well studied, uh, the impact of high-fat diet for metabolic programming, but not only. Uh, also, dietary supplements can influence the metabolic programming, as well as maternal undernutrition and early weaning. Several environmental factors also are involved in metabolic programming, such as smoke cigarettes, exposure to nicotine, pesticides, and also cannabis. Uh, and also uh, several endocrine conditions are associated with the risk to develop disease later in life, such as gestational di diabetes, uh, 
material stress and uh, which is characterized by high glucocorticoid levels and also high levels of leptin. leptin. Uh, the molecular mechanisms involved in um, metabolic programming involves epigenetic adaptation of gene transcription, where increased acetylation of histones and or decrease of DNA methylation are associated with activation of gene transcription, while decrease of histone acetylation and or increase of DNA methylation is uh, associated with gene silencing. And what is what, what this has to do with programming? Uh, this is important because the epigenome is highly dynamic in early life. And for uh, um, by these mechanisms, the offspring can adapt their physiology uh, to the insults that they are that they are exposed in early life. An important um, target tissue in metabolic programming is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is very important uh, region in the central nervous system to control energy balance, to control food intake, energy expenditure. And this region is uh, subdivided in several nuclei, each one with a specific, a specific functions. But uh, we have this region here, which is the arcuate nucleus. Uh, and in this nucleus, we have a very sensitive uh, metabolic um, neurons that are involved directly in the energy balance. <coughs> the arcuate nucleus, uh, we have mainly two neurons population. The one here in pink, which are responsible for producing the neuropeptides NPY and AGRP that are orexigenic. Um, they stimulate food intake and decrease energy expenditure. And on the other hand, we, we also have in this region the pont C neurons, which are anorexigenic. They uh, decrease food intake and increase energy expenditure. And uh, the adipose tissue in the periphery is uh, very important to communicate with this region in the hypothalamus through the hormone leptin. The leptin produced mainly by adipose tissue cross uh, the blain uh, barrier and uh, can activate pont C neurons and uh, inhibit NPY AGRP neurons. And the physiological role of leptin through regulating these neurons is to decrease food intake and increase energy expenditure, contributing to uh, the maintenance of fat storage in the body. However, in the situation of obesity, uh, we have hyperleptinemia because of the adipose tissue is expanded and therefore producing lots of leptin. And this hyperleptinemia um, causes leptin resistance in the hypothalamus, therefore uh, contributing to hyperphagia that is one of the characteristics of obesity. <coughs> leptin, uh, it's important for energy balance through uh, its action in the hypothalamus, but besides that, it's also important for growth and development of the hypothalamus. It acts as a growth factor for this region, which was uh, very um, clear in experiments done by Bouret, published in Science some years ago, where in explants of hypothalamus from mice at postnatal day six, if these explants are exposed to leptin, uh, 
you can see a, a, a very important increase in fiber density from neurons uh, of the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus compared to the controls. And uh, one thing that is interesting is that if you expose these uh, explants uh, in, in an older age, you cannot see this phenomenon anymore, showing that this is a critical window for uh, leptin to act as a growth factor for the hypothalamus. In our lab, um, we developed an experimental model of um, programming in rats in which um, we treat or we fed progenitor female rats with high fat diet during critical windows of development. So we fed uh, these rats um, eight with, the, with the control or high fat diet eight weeks before gestation, all through gestation and lactation. And then uh, after weaning, we, fed, we fed the offspring with control diet. So the exposure to high fat diet, it's only in the mothers, in the progenitors. And then we analyze offspring metabolism in several time points uh, at birth, at weaning when they are uh, 20 days old and in adulthood when they are 150 days old. And in this presentation, I will show you some of our results in the hypothalamus uh, and also uh, general results in the model. Uh, and also we are very interested in sex difference in, the, in this programming model. Um, here I show you birth weight of this um, male and female offspring. Uh, all the graphs are in, are organized in this pattern. So um, control offspring is here in white bars, uh, males. In the black bars, we have the offspring, male offspring whose mothers were fed a high fat diet. Uh, in the dot bar, we have control female offspring. In, in the gray bar, we have the female offspring whose mothers were fed a high fat diet. So uh, you can see here that maternal high fat diet did not affect uh, weight at birth. However, we observed that maternal high fat diet decreases the levels of leptin only in male offspring without any effect in female offspring. We then um, start analyzing the molecular profile of the leptin signaling in the hypothalamus of this offspring at birth. And here you can see the leptin uh, signaling uh, where leptin binds to its uh, receptor in the, in the neurons of the hypothalamus. And this receptor is called OBRB in rats. Uh, this binding activates JAK2 and also subsequently STAT3. And STAT3 acts as um, gene expression regulator, gene transcription factor, uh, will, which will regulate several um, target genes, including that ones encoding for the neuropeptides controlling food intake and energy expenditure like uh, NPY and POMC. So we went to analyze this, um, these molecules in the birth, at birth in the hypothalamus of the offspring. And what we saw was that maternal high fat diet decreased the content of STAT3 in both male and female offspring. And in addition, it decreased the phosphorylation of STAT3 in uh, female offspring without uh, effects in the other proteins of the signaling pathway. So this tell, told us that, um, or at least suggest 
that these animals already at birth, they present signs of leptin resistance by these molecular markers. In fact, when we follow these animals throughout life, I will show you here first data from lactation. Uh, we saw that uh, in middle lactation, both female and male offspring represented here by these dotted lines, uh, they uh, gain more weight throughout lactation uh, compared to their sex match controls. And this weight gain was associated in, uh, at weaning, postnatal day 21, with increased adiposity, uh, hyperleptinemia, and leptin resistance in the hypothalamus of both male and female offspring. Uh, they, they get uh, obesity very, very early. And here you can see uh, some pictures of the adipose tissue histology showing that um, uh, in addition to increased adiposity, these animals, these offspring at weaning, they present larger adipocytes, white adipocytes, which is very, um, is, uh, very dangerous for metabolic and inflammation parameters. One thing that was interesting for us is that uh, we analyzed the, the composition of milk produced by these uh, progenitors. And we saw that the rats fed a high fat diet, they present uh, milk which is hypercaloric, uh, mainly due to high content of fat and high content of sugar. So these, um, this hyper, we, we suggest or we hypothesize that this uh, hypercaloric milk is driving this uh, early obesity that we observed in the offspring already in middle lactation. Um, one thing that was interesting for us um, in the past few years is the relationship between leptin obesity and the lipids, uh, endogenous lipids, cannabinoids. Uh, there is an, uh, an inverse relationship which is physiological between leptin and endocannabinoids, uh, which, in which leptin decreases the synthesis and the tonus of the endocannabinoid system in uh, normal physiology. However, in obesity, uh, we have uh, the development of leptin resistance. With that, uh, this uh, inhibitory effect of leptin on endocannabinoid system is, is lost, and we have an increase of endocannabinoids in this situation. And uh, also, uh, besides of leptin, endocannabinoids are also important regulators of food intake and energy expenditure. And the increase of endocannabinoids, in addition to leptin resistance, contributes to increase even more food intake and decrease energy expenditure, participating in the maintenance of obesity. The main uh, endocannabinoids in our body are the anandamide and 2-AG, which are uh, cannabinoid ligands. They are fat, they are lipid-derived molecules, and they act mainly on two receptors, the cannabinoid receptor type 1, CB1, and the cannabinoid receptor type 2, CB2. And these receptors and endocannabinoids are uh, basically in all the, all the tissues in our, in our body, not only in the brain, but, but also in peripheral tissue. But in the brain, the activation of the endocannabinoid system 
increases food intake, increases uh, and increases the, the pleasure associated with palatable foods, which are in general rich in fat and rich in sugar. In the liver, endocannabinoid system activation is associated with fat liver and development of insulin and leptin resistance. In the pancreas, uh, endocannabinoid system increases uh, secretion of insulin dependent on glucose. Uh, the endocannabinoid system activation, it's also involved in the, in the sensory, um, sensory perception of food, uh, activating uh, receptors in the tongue and also in the central nervous system. In adipose tissue, endocannabinoids activation leads to uh, increased production of uh, uh, inflammatory, inflammatory molecules. And it's also in general associated with increased storage capacity, increased adipogenesis, increased lipogenesis in adipose tissue. And there are several other um, effects in different tissues in our body. In the brain, the endocannabinoid system act as uh, the endocannabinoids act as neuromodulators. And here you can see um, uh, synapse uh, where endocannabinoids 2AG and anantamide are produced by postsynaptic post neurons and they are uh, released to act by binding to CB1 in presynaptic neurons. And therefore modulating and uh, specifically inhibiting the release of neurotransmitters by these neurons. Um, so this uh, system is really uh, acting as neuromodulators in the hypothalamus in, and other brain areas. So what we saw in our model is that uh, maternal high fat diet induces uh, an increase in the CB1 content in the hypothalamus of male offspring at birth and increase the CB2 expression in the hypothalamus of female uh, offspring at birth. And remember that we had uh, some um, suggestion that in this offspring, we had already at birth leptin resistance with this in accordance to this profile of overactivation of the endocannabinoid system. This was associated, but only in male offspring with an increase of the neuropeptide orexin A, which stimulates food intake, but we did not observe any uh, impact of maternal nutrition uh, in the female hypothalamus. So we then analyzed these offspring in adulthood, and we wanted to know if they are, um, if, the, if there, there was any impact of maternal nutrition during early life on their food preference. And we tested these in, uh, in this adult offspring. And we mm. observed that the offspring uh, whose mothers were exposed to high fat diet during uh, gestation and lactation, they prefer to, uh, they prefer consume high fat diet. And this is true for male offspring and also for female offspring. So they prefer to, uh, to eat high fat diet, the same diet that they, their moms were consuming when they, they were uh, developing. And lastly, we, uh, we asked themselves if there was any epigenetic regulation or some epigenetic regulation at the CB1 level in these uh, offspring. So we went back to early life of these animals and we analyzed epigenetic markers in the hypothalamus of the offspring 
at birth. And we focus on the CNR1 gene, which is which uh, codes for the CB1 receptor. And here is a, a schematic showing the organization of this receptor. It has two exons. And we analyzed the DNA methylation around the first exon of CNR1 gene, and also histone acetylation in the distal promoter of this gene. And what we observed was that maternal high fat diet did not impact DNA methylation uh, in the hypothalamus of the offspring, at least in these four CPG sites that we analyzed in this study. However, we observed that uh, maternal high fat diet increases the histone acetylation in the promoter of the CNR1 gene only of uh, male of in the hypothalamus of male offspring without any impact in female offspring, at least in this uh, distal region. And uh, it's not show, showed here, but we also saw that uh, in, in, these, uh, in these groups, there is an increase in mRNA for CNR1 promoter, which suggests increased transcription as expected for uh, increased histone acetylation. So uh, what we saw in, in brief was that maternal high fat diet differentially impacts hypothalamus of the offspring of male and female offspring. In male offspring, we saw that maternal high fat diet increases CB1 at the protein level, at the mRNA level, and this was associated with increased acetylation in the CNR1 gene and also increasing binding of androgen receptor to this um, promoter. And on the other hand, in the hypothalamus from female offspring, we didn't see any change in CB1 protein levels, neither in uh, epigenetic markers in the CNR1 gene. But on the other hand, we saw an increase in CB2, which is suggestive of neuroinflammation. And we know that neuroinflammation also contributes for hypothalamic dysfunction and leptin resistance uh, associated with obesity. So um, we showed uh, through different mechanisms that maternal high fat diet can impact uh, the, the offspring throughout life programming hyperphagia, high fat diet preference, and obesity at adulthood. Um, now, uh, just very briefly, I just want to tell you that besides the hypothalamus, we are investigating the endocannabinoid system in the offspring in several peripheral tissues, such as white adipose tissue, brown adipose tissue, liver. We start studying the uh, GIT also. And uh, we observe that maternal high fat diet impacts not only the central endocannabinoid system, but also the peripheral endocannabinoid system. And we are now trying to reprogram uh, these phenotypes treating the mothers during gestation with fish oil that can modulate the production of end endocannabinoids. Uh, I would like to thank uh, for your attention and once again for the FESB organization for this opportunity and all the researchers and uh, grad and undergrad students involved in this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Isis, uh, for your presentation. Now, uh, I would like to introduce Professor Jorge Cruz. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce him. He's an emeritus professor from the Pediatric, Pediatrician and Endocrinology from the University of Atenas. Uh, he's holder of UNESCO Chair on Adolescent Health 
care. He's doing a fantastic work in the neuroimmune endocrinology area, uh, for, uh, more specifically with stress response for more than 30 years. years. He's one of the most cited science in clinical medicine, biology, biochemistry, and endocrinology area. Professor Cruzes has already produced more than 1,000 papers and has an 18 index of over 109. He has formed and mentored a broad community of physicians and scientists around the world, including Europe, US, and Latin America. Professor Cruz receives numerous international awards, including awards from diverse societies, such as US and Doctrine Society, Society, the International Society for Neuroimmunomodulation. He also received the Aristonoid Brodowski Award, the highest distinction from accomplished in the science in Greece, among other awards and honors. Please welcome Professor Cruzes. As you know, stress is an old concept that has been revived in the past uh, 20 or 30 years. And it's very fashionable right now. This is from Science News called Stressed Out or How Chronic Stress Wreaks Havoc. Now, the lecture has four parts complexity and human uniqueness, concepts of homeostasis and stress, stress mechanisms, and effects of stress on the organism. Sophocles had written that there are many wonderful things and nothing is more wonderful than the human. Instead of the word wonderful, if you put the word complex, you'll be correct. Humans are the most complex system we know in this world, in this universe. Why are we so complex? First, we have very complex cells. Remember, we have uh, 3 billion bases. We have over 40,000 genes, of which half, about 20, 22,000, are genes that code RNA, non-coding RNA. And finally, we know that in our genome, in our simple cells, we have over 1 million regulatory sequences. So cells are very complex. Second, the brain is very complex. We have 100 billion neurons. We have over 10 to the 18th power synapses. And this number is lower than the number, higher than the number of the stars in our galaxy. And finally, we have the phenomenon of plasticity, the ability of our neurons to change functions. And then if we go back and talk about complex systems, we know that Alcmeon uh, in the fifth century uh, BC, said that harmony is the union of multiple mixed components and the agreement of the opposites. Okay, so that's the definition of complex systems. And if you look what happens to complexity from the beginning of our universe, from the Big Bang back here, with time, the, 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 the universe gets more and more complex, formation of galaxies, stars, etc. And right now we are at the peak of our complexity with humans and the human civilization. On this axis, what you see, it's called power density, but it basically means power of information, complexity of information. So man and his civilization are of unique complexity. Complex systems are in a dynamic disequilibrium that requires energy to be sustained. That's what we are. And complex systems have organizing principles and follow mathematical rules. That's why nowadays we speak about systems biology and systems medicine, because we're dealing with this huge complexity of the human organism. Now, a few words about homeostasis and stress. Pythagoras was the first to talk about complex systems and about homeostasis. He said the universe is in a equilibrium, a balance, which is harmonious, so that's harmony. And uh, this balance corresponds to homeostasis in humans. Now, this balance in the universe is disturbed by disturbing forces and counteracted and reestablishing by reestablishing forces. And then if we go to humans, we have homeostasis, which is the balance. We have stressors on this side that 
disturb this balance. And we have the adaptive response on this side that brings the balance back. So it's, it's a continuous fight between stressors and adaptive responses. And the end result is that we maintain our homeostasis. We maintain our life, harmonious life. Now, Alcmeon was a student of Pythagoras and he called homeostasis isonomia. But a couple of centuries later, Epicurus, who founded the Epicurean philosophy, called about eustathia. And he said eustathia is nothing else but uh, the balance of the soul and the body. And finally, the word homeostasis was coined by Walter Cannon at the beginning of the 20th century. So this is the definition of Epicurean eustathia, which says it's the balanced state of the flesh and the soul. And that's exactly how we understand homeostasis now. So now what is stress? Stress is a state of threatened or in us humans perceived as threatened homeostasis. Now, Antisthenes had written that uh, the beginning of science is the visit of names. So let's visit the name stress. It's an Indo-European root. In Greek, it's strangaluin, which means to strangle. That's where the English word strangle came from. And also the words catastrophe and strabismus. When you see this STR, that means something bad. And in Latin, it's stringere, which means to draw tight or to press. So when somebody is in stress, is in a state of threatened homeostasis. Now, the concept of homeostasis and stress started, as I said, with Pythagoras. But then Hippocrates suggested that the harmonious balance of the elements as qualities of life is health and disharmony is disease. And he was right. And he also said that it's nature that heals the diseases, not the doctor. The doctor just helps. Aristotle suggested that there is unity of body and mind and also described eudaimonia, a tranquil, non-sensual pleasure. Very important. The Stoics, the skeptics, and the Epicureans talked about ataraxia, which means imperturbability of mind, equanimity. And also uh, suggested that the mind controls affect. OK, the mind controls affect. And it's true. Also, Epicureans added aponia, which is no pain, and hedony, but not as hedony as we mean it with this word, but as eudaimonia. All right, then we have Claude Bernard with the milieu interior, Walter Cannon, homeostasis and stress. He also described the fight or flight response, and later on, a Swedish scientist added the freeze reaction. And finally, went with Hans Selye, who talked about the general adaptation syndrome or stress syndrome, and he talked about diseases of adaptation and bad stress, distress versus you stress, good stress. And basically, what he said that a lot of human morbidity is because of stress. Uh, so he talked about diseases of adaptation, stress diseases. He was correct, as you'll see later on, but. Uh, it wasn't considered correct at his time, and he did not get a Nobel Prize because of that. They thought that he was exaggerating, that he was going beyond his data to talk about diseases or adaptation. Now, humans are complex biological systems, and we communicate with, with each other through empathy. Okay, And there is a neurological system in our brain that's responsible for empathy and emotional epidemiology. We automatically, spontaneously try to think how another person thinks and how to feel how a person feels. That's empathy. There is the so-called cognitive and emotional empathy. Very important function. Now, for many, many millions of years, stress was acute and it was really fight or flight, like here. Nowadays, stress is not acute, it's chronic, and it's mostly psychosocioeconomic, okay? So it's psychosocial stress, really, what bothers humanity and what creates 
disease in humanity nowadays. Now, these are the human stressors. Those are, as I said, stimuli that threaten our or disturb our homeostasis. And it can be daily hassles, life transitions, catastrophes, starvation, but also excessive nutrition, deficient exercise, but also excessive exercise. Obesity is a stressor for the human being. Then we have socioeconomic status. The poorer we are, the more stressed we are. Minority, minority status, loneliness, work stress, especially the so-called effort reward imbalance. If we feel that we work uh, a lot and we don't get enough of our work, that's stressful. Also, unemployment is very stressful. Job loss, downsizing, loss of control, social inequality, bereavement, taking care of sick subjects, important for us in, in medicine, but also important for people who have relatives that they have to uh, take care of. And if empathy is to such extent that it becomes injurious to ourselves, then it's no longer good empathy. It's pathologic empathy, okay, which actually stresses us and uh, damages us because of this chronic stress. Now, what we try to do nowadays is instead of pathologic empathy to develop principled compassion, which means to be empathic, mainly cognitively, less emotionally, and thus not be stressed ourselves and be able to deal with the patient without stressing ourselves, which means that we feel better, we help the patient, the patient feels better, less stress for both the doctor and the patient. Then we have addictions, toxic substances, chronic diseases are stressful, and so are some treatments of diseases. Think of chemotherapy, inflammations, all types, traumatic, infectious, autoimmune, allergic, if they're chronic or excessive. And also we have what we call para-inflammation. This is inflammation that we see in chronic stress. That inflammation, chronic stress-related inflammation, is not helpful, it's damaging. That's why we call it para-inflammation, not inflammation. All psychiatric disorders such as anxiety, depression, personality disorders are stressful. Sleep deficiency, but also sleep excess are stressful. And coupling of the clock, the so-called jet lag, right? That is quite stressful and we know that from many studies, but recently we've been talking about social jet lag. In other words, uh, sleep every night at 11 and then on the weekend sleep at three or 4 a.m. This is stressful for the body. It's called social jet lag and it's very stressful. It takes about three days to correct jet lag. So, if you have that every week, that means for about uh, five days a week, you're very stressed. That's not good. Finally, we have the so-called behavioral addictions, such as metamodern stress, cyborg stress. This is dealing with a lot of information or be dependent on our screens, on our smartphones, our computers, etc. And this is how one feels when uh, is, has cyborg stress. Now, all the stresses that I mentioned, they all accumulate one on top of the other, and the end result is more than, uh, than uh, the result of one stressor. It's multiple stressors, and it can be synergistic rather than uh, additive. What you see here is a young woman who's trying to do everything. In the past 50 years, women uh, have gotten a bad rap, okay? They're uh, more stressed than men for various reasons, because they have to go to work and they have to take care of the children. Now, normally, we hope that we're in a healthy baseline homeostasis. Then something happens, our homeostasis is disturbed, but then the adaptive response can, in the majority of cases, it takes us back where we were before. So, we're fine. However, there are situations where either excessive or chronic stress does not allow the body to come back to homeostasis. 
survives on one side, but it's not a healthy homeostasis, which you can call allostasis or cacostasis, which is damaging. On the other hand, people can learn from stress and next time they have it, they can deal better with it or they can do things like exercise moderately that would improve their homeostasis. So we have improved homeostasis, which is protective, not damaging, which is we can call hyperstasis. Now, what is a resilience? You must have heard the word. It's very fashionable nowadays. Well, resilience means that if you're stressed, the disturbance in your body is small and it doesn't last very long. So people who are in improved homeostasis or hyperstasis are resilient. They can tolerate stress and they can recover very rapidly. Okay, very important. Now let's go to stress mechanisms. Uh, the stress system uh, is basically the hypothalamic pituitary unit and the uh, brain stem, especially the so-called locus ceruleus, which is responsible for arousal and the centers of the autonomic nervous system. Now, when we're activated, both of the systems are activated. And now we know that they communicate with each other directly with nerves. So CRH neurons uh, send projections to the brain stem to stimulate norepinephrine secretion and norepinephrine neurons send projections to the hypothalamus where they stimulate CRH secretion. So it's basically a positive reverberating feedback loop. When you're stressed, you tend to get more and more stressed. So for that, you need brakes. And the brakes are shown here. Uh, here again is the CRS neurons in the hypothalamus. This is the locus cerulean norepinephrine neurons in the brain stem. And one major uh, uh, break is the arcuit nucleus. PMC neurons, some of them are activated by CRH and norepinephrine, and uh, uh, they produce beta endorphin and alpha MSH, which inhibit both the hypothalamus and the brainstem. Also, we have two ultra short loop feedbacks with CRH inhibiting itself and norepinephrine inhibiting itself. And then we have the very important GABA benzodiazepine system, which exerts tonic and regulatory negative effect on the stress system. Most of this action comes from the hippocampus. So the hippocampus inhibits the stress system through the GABA system, okay? Then let me mention the serotonergic and cholinergic systems, which are acutely stimulatory of the stress system. When things get chronic, things change, but acutely they're stimulatory. I told you already about the hippocampus, which is inhibitory. I have to tell you about the amygdala, the centers of fear and anger, which are activated by the stress system and activate the stress system. That's a second positive reverberatory feedback loop. And finally, very important, is the mesocortical and mesolimbic system, the so-called reward system of the brain, which is activated by stress. So when you're stressed acutely, you become more optimistic so you can deal with the stressor. Okay, that's activation of dopamine in the reward system of the brain. However, when the reward system is activated, that sends inhibitory uh, stimuli, inhibitory stimuli to the stress system. So remember it like this, if you feel well, you don't feel stressed. So if you activate the reward system, you're gonna suppress the stress system. Keep this very important for when you deal with stress. And here is a summary of all, of everything. We we're very surprised to find that the amygdala operate with CRH, the central nucleus. In other words, they produce CRH which activate norepinephrine, okay? And then norepinephrine activates amygdala CRH. Also we learn that vasopressin is an important synergistic factor with CRH. We also learn that the postganglionic sympathetic neurons secrete not only norepinephrine, 
or epinephrine in the medulla, but also CRH in the periphery. And this CRH is a stimulus of the mast cell. It causes mast cell degranulation. So if you have activation of the stress response, you're activating the amygdala, the hypothalamus, the brainstem, uh, all this parasympathetic, the sympathetic system, the adrenal medulla, and CRH would uh, degranulate mast cells. Now, let's go to how stress inhibits all the other important axes. First of all, reproductive system. Alexa, stop. Alexa, stop. I'm sorry. Um, so whenever you activate the stress system, you inhibit through these mechanisms that you see here, the reproductive system, okay? So you get hypogonadism. When activate stress, you uh, suppress growth and you suppress thyroid function. Excuse me. Um, now, also when you have an activation of the stress system, we call the so-called euthyroid 6 syndrome. In other words, we inhibit TSH, we inhibit conversion of T4 to the active T3, right? And you end up with the lowest TSH, uh, low uh, normal T4 and low T3. That's the euthyroid 6 syndrome. It's important because it conserves energy. And then as far as the immune response is concerned, uh, the uh, stress system through glucorticoids primarily inhibits the inflammatory cytokines and the uh, inflammation mediators, okay? It inhibits them. On the other hand, cytokines and inflammatory mediators can stimulate CRH, ACTH, and glucorticoids. Therefore, here we have another feedback system with inflammation stimulating the HPA axis and the HPA axis inhibiting inflammation. Also, another thing that happens when you have chronic uh, stress is you convert uh, TH1 cells to TH2 cells. So you go from cellular immunity to humoral immunity. And as I said before, you also get the so-called para-inflammation. And basically you get the para-inflammation because the sympathetic system through norepinephrine and epinephrine stimulates the production of interleukin-6. So whenever you stress, you not only uh, cause activation of catecholamine secretion, but also activation of interleukin-6 secretion. Interleukin-6 is a powerful, inflammatory cytokine, which also causes somnolence and fatigue. It's somnogenic and fatigogenic. And we believe that uh, it's part of the breaks of the stress response, because after you stress, the IL-6 that you produce will make you fatigue and somnolent. So you go somewhere to recover from the stress reaction, which is costly metabolically. Now, here are the areas of the brain. This is the frontal lobe, basically, that regulate affect, that regulate sentiment. Very important as far as stress is concerned. Also, this part of the frontal lobe that you see here is very important in switching affect from positive to negative. And chronic stress stabilizes it to the negative. So if you're chronic stress for various reasons that I mentioned, uh, you become dysphoric in contrast to acute stress when you can become euphoric. Here you see the amygdala, right? The two amygdala. And you can understand that this system uh, is interacting in multiple ways. Here I'm showing you the reward system. Very important is this nucleus here, which is called ventral tegmental area. This nucleus secretes dopamine. Dopamine through 
uh, neurons, neuraxis, travels towards the so-called nucleus accumbens or mesolimbic system and uh, stimulates euphoria. Also, dopamine goes all the way to the frontal lobe and it influences the activity of the frontal lobe as well. Now, this is interesting. A few years ago, people discovered that uh, this nucleus here, number five, it's called habenula, and there's the bridle. Uh, whenever it's activated, it suppresses dopamine secretion in the nucleus accumbens, And uh, it's activated in depression. And it seems that it's a major uh, site for generation of remorses. We did something bad, when you feel bad, it seems that this nucleus here suppresses your dopamine, so you feel worse. So if I put everything together, this is a stress system. We have production of cortisol, catecholamines, and interleukin-6. The stress system activates the amygdala. So it activates fear and anger. The amygdala activates the stress system. So if you activate the amygdala, then you produce cortisol and catecholamines and IL-6. Then you have the hippocampus, which is very important for suppression of the stress system. And finally, we have the mesocortical, mesolimbic system, the reward system, which is activated by the stress system and the amygdala, but which, when activated, suppresses the stress system and suppresses the amygdala. So if you want to do something good to yourself, try to feel well, okay? Because when you feel well, you suppress the stress system and you save yourself from the damages that the stress system produces. So remember this, the stress system tone chronically, chronically inhibits the reward system tone However, the reward system tone acutely and chronically inhibits the stress system tone. So it's a very interesting relationship. You must always think acute and chronic. Stress is bad, usually in humans, if it's chronic. And it's, as I said before, psychosocial economic. Now, the stress system, it's shown here in the middle, affects everything, affect, behavior, growth, immune function, the biologic clock, sleep, the reproductive system, the aging of the body, and the development of the human. So there is no real function that's not affected by the stress system. Now, the timing of stress is very important because if you have stress, during the critical periods of life, which is the prenatal period, the first five years of life and adolescence, puberty, then the effects can be chronic or permanent. Okay, it's epigenetic effects. Now, also, uh, I talked about chronic stress, but I'll say in a few words that there is acute pathology in response to stress, not as much and not as important as the chronic pathology as far as epidemiology is concerned. However, there is acute pathology and chronic pathology. What you see here is the human brain. The human brain reaches the weight of a, an adult at about the age of nine or 10 years here. There. However, something that we must keep in mind is that there are rapid changes in the number of synapses. In other words, in the number of circuits in our brain the peak number of sequences in our brain is at two years of life here. Then the number of synapses go down, further down significantly during puberty, and then become asymptotic, parallel, okay? The reason I'm mentioning this is because if stress occurs prenatally, first five years of life and puberty, then you may have big problems with that individual. And here are the various functions of the brain as far as time is concerned. Here's the sensory pathways, vision and hearing. 
the maximum number of synapses and circuits is at four months of age. That's why it's very important to avoid amblyopia and deafness. Second, language. Very surprisingly, the peaks uh, circuits for languages are eight or nine months of age when the baby doesn't speak yet. And then the higher cognitive function, the important higher functions of the human brain, peak at about one or two years of life. And then by the age of nine or 10, they've almost been completed. That's why these periods are so important for stress. Now, when we talk about higher functions, we talk really about frontal lobe, okay? Which interprets the environment and the social cues, solves problem, plans for the future, and is important for controlling emotions, controlling impulses. So if a child has been affected in the first five or six years of life, they have defects in all of these problems this year. All of these functions are defective. These children as adults don't do well at all. Many of them end up in jails and prisons. About 85% of males and female inmates in American prisons have been abused in the first years of their lives. Okay, the effect is marked and uh, many times it's irreversible. It's not completely irreversible, but it can be irreversible. All of these changes that occur during these critical periods of life are in fact epigenetic changes. And which are the hormones that are most epigenetically active? CRH, glucocorticoids, sex steroids, androgens and estrogens, and cytokines, okay? So the hormones that are affected by the stress system are the ones that are important for um, epigenetics, for epigenetic regulation. Now, think of two things that happen during stress. As I said, the stress system is activated and we know very well what a stress response is. However, we have a, a second stress response which has to do with uh, toxic substances. Okay, that's the immune system, the immune response. As I said, the stress system produces a little bit of inflammation through IL-6. However, if you get a foreign agent, a bacterium or something attacking the organism, then you develop a so-called sickness syndrome. Like with the stress syndrome, we have the sickness syndrome, which consists of anorexia and nausea, fatigue, depressed affect, somnolence, hyperalgesia, fever, and increased metabolic rate. And here, the main uh, effectors, molecular effectors, are the inflammatory cytokines and the mediators. So when you have inflammatory stress shown here, you get the sickness syndrome as well as the classic stress syndrome. And in fact, what happens is you start with the sickness syndrome, sickness behavior, you activate the acute phase reaction, you activate the fatigue and pain neural afferent program, and number two, you activate, excuse me, the stress syndrome. And as I said, the stress syndrome is associated with production of glucorticoids that are immunosuppressive, right? And anti-inflammatory. So the stress syndrome plays a role in the inhibition of the immune inflammatory response. So you should know that chronic stress has two effects. It has effects of stress per se, dysphoria, as I mentioned before, but you also can have effects of sickness syndrome. Okay, that's why one of the most common manifestations of depression is fatigue. These people get up in the morning and they can't get up from bed. They're very fatigued. Why? It's because they have activated not only stress syndrome, but also sickness syndrome. Okay, let me say a few words about the effects of stress and close. Let me know when my time is up. Uh, as I said before, this is a system, that's a way to think of it, that regulates all of our functions in our body. Now, there are some people who've been stressed young or because they are genetically uh, more sensitive 
or they have epigenetic changes. There are people who are very responsive, reactive to stress. Uh, you can see it with various ways, the anxious responses, neurotic responses, and so forth. Generally, these people have a hyperactive stress system, hyperactive amygdala, hypoactive hippocampus, and hypoactive reward system, okay? And in, in other words, this, the, this whole system is shifted to one side. They're most sensitive to stress. And you have the opposite. There are people who are very resistant to stress. And this, as I said, is regulated genetically and epigenetically. Now, these are all the acute situations where you can get during acute stress. You can get an asthma episode. You can get eczema or uric area. You can get migraines or tension headaches. You can get GI pain. That's very common. As you know, it's the most common sensitization in children and women. You can get hypertensive episodes. And if you, are, if you have atherosclerosis, you can die from it. You can get cardiac ischemia. If you have atherosclerosis, you can develop an MI, an arrhythmia. You can die for it. And then we have the so-called Takotsubo disease, which is acute heart failure. You have a big stress. You have acute heart failure. 50% of people with Takotsubo die right there on the spot. And they're young. So if you hear some athletes or other people that are stressed in, in a major way and drop dead, it's quite possibly uh, Takotsubo uh, disease. And of course, stress can uh, precipitate psychotic episodes. Generally, the way to think of acute stress is that it may get out some of your weaknesses. We all have weaknesses, genetic and epigenetic. Acute stress will get them out if you have them. This is Takotsubo. Takotsubo means an octopus in a bottle because the heart looks like this. It's like you have an octopus in a bottle. It's Japanese. Now, whenever you're stressed, as I said, peripheral nerves, the postganglionic sympathetic neurons, secrete CRH. The black area that you see here, the dark one, is immune CRH after stress. And if you look what happens to the mast cells, that's what you see here. This is a mast cell with, dyed with methyl blue, methylene blue. And in the presence of CRH or stress, you get the granulation, you can see the granules. The granules are full of histamine, right? Serotonin, proteases, um, IL-6, TNF-alpha, prostaglandins. All of these are generally pro-inflammatory. That's why they can precipitate, let's say, an asthma attack. It's because you degranulate mast cells in the bronchi. Now, as far as the uh, GI system is concerned, stress through CRH inhibits the vagus nerve, which means it inhibits gastric motility. So you get a uh, heavy stomach. Okay, you can't digest your food. And second, more important, <coughs> CRH stimulates as I said, the locus ferus norepinephrine system, which stimulates the secular parasympathetic neurons to increase colonic motility, okay? So that's the secret of stress causing GI effects, somatization. And now here are the chronic effects of the stress system, which are, as you see, much more important than the acute effects. And they're very pervasive. Okay, if you go to the age of 50 to 60, you see many of these effects already develop. Okay, what are these effects? <coughs> First of all, there are psychological effects. Chronic stress causes anxiety and depression, dysphoria as before, tendency for addiction, antisocial behavior, psychosomatic disorders, fatigue and pain. Okay. Chronic stress also can affect directly the, the body. It can cause loss of weight in about 7% of people. 
the majority of people with chronic stress, they put on weight, they gain weight. Children can have poor growth. Obesity is a problem. Metabolic syndrome is a problem. Smolder inflammation of para-inflammation is a problem. Immune dysfunction and autoimmunity. Atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. Also, it causes osteopenia and osteoporosis. It causes premature aging of the entire body, but also it includes uh, aging skin and brain neuro neurodegeneration. It increases vulnerability to certain infections and cancers. And um, basically, if you put all this here, and think of chronic non-communicable diseases, it's everything. So chronic stress gradually <coughs> causes so-called chronic non-communicable diseases. And who is getting uh, COVID-19 nowadays? People who have been chronically stressed, okay? Why? Because chronic stress really damages the immune system, causes para-inflammation, and if you have increased inflammation, like in obesity or chronic stress, then you're more prone to develop and die from uh, COVID-19. Now, infections, we knew for a long time that <coughs> stress increases vulnerability to common cold. And remember that the coronavirus is really a common cold virus that has turned bad. And also, <coughs> stress inhibits the immune system that deals with leprosy and uh, tuberculosis. So in the old times, people who were lepers or they had tuberculosis were people who were chronically stressed. Many of them were depressed. They started with depression and then they got the disease. And here's a summary of what happens depending on our genetic variation, developmental history, stress, which is, can be real or perceived, nutrition, which can be good or bad, as you know, aging, we have changes in stress system activity, we have hypersecretion of cortisol, hyposecretion of all of these hormones here, hypersecretion of norepinephrine and prenephrine and IL-6. What does cortisol do in catecholamines? They stimulate gluconeogenesis. Glucogenesis stimulate insulin. Insulin together with cortisol are a very potent growth factor for visceral fat, okay? For intra-abdominal fat. So chronic stress leads to visceral obesity and therefore insulin resistance. It leads to sarcopenia because cortisol and IL-6 uh, cause hypotrophy of the skeletal muscle. It leads to metabolic syndrome. And if you have the right genes to diabetes mellitus type 2, it also causes hypertension, increased coagulation of blood, increased acute phase reactants. And that's how this coagulation happens. Increased cytokines. Let me remind you that the visceral fat is secreting a tremendous amount of cytokines, which all go through the liver. Okay, and they, they cause liver disease. Okay, the so-called so non-alcoholic steatohepatosis. Okay, so also Bruce stress is... causes, yes? We are short of time. Uh, okay, so let me finish. I think this, this was my last slide that I want to present. Also we develop dyslipidemia, increased triglycerides, increased LDL, decreased HDL, sickness syndrome manifestations, PCOS in women who have the right genes, endothelial dysfunction, inflammation, atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis and osteopenia, and sleep apnea, okay? So stress, chronic, is pervasive, and it affects a large percentage of the population. In the United States, about 65% of people at the age of 50 already have partial or complete metabolic syndrome. Therefore, they're more vulnerable to various diseases. Despite this fact, Americans 
live long and it's strange. And uh, we know now why they live long because they have very good drugs. So you can block many of these risk factors with medications. So take care of stress and you'll be healthier. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dr. George, for great presentation.